Living in Rest, God's Antidote to Struggling and Striving. Chapter 5, Reality Greater Than Ideas. Since Christ, though innocent, suffered in his flesh for you, now you must also be a prepared soldier, having the same mindset, for whoever has died in his body is done with sin. So live the rest of your earthly life no longer concerned with human desires, but consumed with what brings pleasure to God. 1 Peter 4, 1-2 When God is pleased, I am pleased. Our satisfaction should have nothing to do with us and everything to do with Him. Why? Because we have left behind our own pursuits to pick up a single-eyed focus on bringing God pleasure. It's His life, His will, and His desires. Life is not lived if we are still living for ourselves. Life is lived when it's lived for the one who gave it. Sons and daughters are to bow in humility, allowing the king to work his life through them. Do we battle fleshly desires? Absolutely. Yet we ought not condone the desires of the flesh in the name of grace. Grace does not wink at us as we eat from the enemy's hand. Instead, grace empowers us to refuse what the enemy offers. When you've tasted true goodness, your appetite for the things of the enemy fades. Tasting his goodness produces humility, joy, rest, and peace. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We all know that we must first come to Jesus. Yet in order to come forward to him, we must surrender our will to his. It's in the surrender of our will that we are positioned to walk toward him to receive the rest he longs to give. If you are restless, it's simply the result of not coming to him. Habitual sin, struggles, and dark patterns that continue in our lives are often the result of us confessing that we are sons and daughters without believing that we are sons and daughters. Logic and reason can be our biggest downfall in humanity. Even Adam and Eve wanted to know what God knew, partaking of the forbidden tree in order to obtain insight that wasn't theirs to gain. They failed to see that they were already like God because they were with God. The enemy convinced them that they could be like God without God. This same lie has been duplicated profusely today. If I am in union with Jesus, he is in union with me. It's great to hide yourself in Christ. Yet it's also important to understand that it's Christ in you who is the hope of glory. It's not merely being in Christ, but believing and realizing that Christ is in us. I'm not splitting hairs or debating semantics. It's understanding the language and the reality that God has given us regarding the intimacy shown in God making us his home. If sin is not allowed in Christ, and Christ never chooses sin, what does it say about me if I'm constantly chasing something other than him? It means I want to believe, but I've not yet found the revelation to believe. For me, in 2008, I lived in the idea of Christ in me. Yet it was not until 2016 that I stepped into the revelation of Christ in me. For eight years, I lived in the idea of Christ and struggled every single day as a result. Finally, I found the revelation of Christ, and it's been a completely different story since. Many want to live and believe in the idea, but they haven't stepped into the reality of Jesus. See, the Israelites had the idea of who God was. Moses stepped into the reality of who God was. Realities are far more important than ideas. In the opening chapter, I discussed that the gospel is experiential. This means it's not theoretical. It's not merely an idea. It's a real revelation of something we desperately need. It truly comes down to this. Are you satisfied with the idea of Jesus? Or do you want to experience him so that you can step into his reality? Sin is not defeated by the idea of Christ. Sin is defeated by the reality of Christ. When Christ shows up, demons flee, sickness is healed, and darkness is expelled. Sonship becomes easy when you step into the reality of Jesus. Believing is the only prerequisite. You might ask, how do I defeat sin and come to this reality of Jesus? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul gives us a little clue. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
whom you have from God, and you are not your own? This truly makes it simple. You're no longer reaching to obtain God when you know He is in you. The desires of flesh can be doused with a simple inward retreat to the living God. These fleshly impulses can be silenced by removing yourself from the equation and turning inwardly to the God who lives in you. When sin presents itself to me, I retreat with the shift of my focus. Submitting to the Lord means you allow the Lord to take possession of you. The devil knows he cannot touch you when you're in the possession of God. James hammered this when he said, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Jesus said, Go and sin no more. He would not have said it if it wasn't possible. Yet he knows the only way it is possible is by retreating into him the same way a son would find refuge in his father. It is by and through the grace dispensed in these times that we are able to move forward free from sin. Grace teaches us what sin is and what sin is not. Put simply, sin is disobedience to the will of God. Any action that is in defiance of his will and word is sin. Unbelief is sin, for one is denying the fact that he is king. In fact, one could argue that all sin is wrapped up in the evil of unbelief. Unbelief is the very sin that sends people through hell on earth and to hell in the hereafter. Throughout scripture, God continually calls us to a place of belief. Have faith in God, Jesus answered in Mark eleven twenty two. This is one of the shortest yet most piercing passages in the New Testament. It was belief that brought Mary to the feet of Jesus. When criticized by Martha, Christ was quick to point out that Mary was doing the good thing. She was doing the better thing, the most important thing, and the most obedient thing. She was sitting, resting, and receiving every drop of revelation that Christ was dispensing through his presence. Beyond this, there are countless examples in Scripture of simple faith in God that produce rest, peace, grace, and transformation in the life of a person. You live the most when you are seated at His feet. When you sit at His feet, He brings you up into His face. Look how David described those who are at His feet. In Psalm 145.10, All your godly lovers will be found bowing before you. What's so important about bowing? Bowing displays surrender and points to the one you're bowing to. If you walked into a room and I was bowing to an object, you would look at me for a moment, but ultimately your gaze would shift to see what I was bowing before. Our bowing points to the person of Christ. Suddenly, the eyes of bystanders are shifted from us to him. David goes on to say in verses 11 and 12, They will tell the world of the lavish splendor of your kingdom and preach about your limitless power. They will demonstrate for all to see your miracles of might and reveal the glorious majesty of your kingdom. It's a powerful list. Preaching about God's unlimited power, demonstrating miracles, and revealing His glory. It sounds like the type of conference you and I want to be at. Yet the prerequisite to all of that is one thing. Bowing. You have to be found bowing in private before you're found ministering in public. Otherwise, we enter into works based faith, which we will unpack in detail later in the book. He didn't call us to work, He called us to obey. In our obedience, we are overcome with a loving desire to work. Forget the idea of who Jesus is and step into the reality of who Jesus is. Step into your high calling. Dismiss your own ways. Refuse to eat from the hand of the enemy. Find yourself in Jesus, the safe harbor, and enjoy the reality of Him in you.